the Sex Pistols Brixton Academy shows. Oh, what with Goldie? Yeah. Goldie did say to me one night that he was quite, although he was struggling a bit, he was quite pleased because they threw so much, so many coins at him and he actually made quite a few bucks. <laughs> <laughs> You need the Kellervision app. 24 7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. THTC, the UK's leading ethical streetwear label. Organically grown and ethically built garments from hemp, organic cotton and other sustainable materials. 2019 is their 20th anniversary year. Join me with THTC as a Killer Keller podcast sponsor celebrating music, social activism, hemp and street culture. THTC, eco-fashion redefined since 1999. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we're here to talk about world music and street culture. Podcast. Hold that quote. We're going in. We're going to kick it off right now, right? Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast in effect. Um, big shout out to all the followers, the regulars. Uh, you know who you are and you know what we're doing here. It's just street culture, music and otherwise, all right? Um, big shout out to Graffiti Kings. Um, that question we have inside the room today via technical advancements and, uh, and Zoom, um, a man that, uh, yeah, he to his credit has said that he was in the, the, the right place at the right time. I, you know, I beg to differ. No, no, put, put himself in the right place at the right time. <laughs> put himself, put himself in the right place at the right time. Um, legacy holder, um, and a proprietor of the punk sound, um, is the man like Glenn Matlock. How are you, brother? All right. How you doing, Echo? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm doing all right. So what do I call you? Mr. Keller or Mr. Killer? You just call me Keller, yeah. KK. Hey, hey, K- hey, KK. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You, you know what, Glenn? You can call me whatever you like. That's the one for me. KK, love it. <laughs> Londoner. Still in London now, aren't you, sir? Still in London now. Wasn't supposed to be. Um, but my, the rug was pulled from underneath my feet. It's the same with everybody else mm. this year. I was, I was, my plan, I did a, Tour of the UK start of the year, mm. and then I was going off to New York and, and the east coast of the states and Canada. I had some solo shows to do. Oh, wow. um, I was opening up for the Dropkick Murphys and their big St. Patrick's Day in Boston, and then I was going to end up in New York and sit on in on the mix of the, the album that I just made over last Christmas, and I couldn't do any of that because of what's happened. And then I was going to, I was being offered quite a lot of shows and I was just going to hang out in New York because I had, um, I got a work permit that's just expired. So I was going to, at the end of October and they're kind of quite hard to come by. So, um, yeah, that that was my plan for the year and it's been weird. But it was kind of quite funny because I've been touring with an old mate of mine and I say old because he is getting on a bit. There's a guy called El Slick. Oh, yeah. Yeah, legend, legend. I mean, yeah, we we'll get into this he for played sure. Car with me, and he got stuck over her, so it was just me and him mm. in my pad, and it was a bit like I don't know. You're probably too young for this. The the odd couple, you know, Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon. No, I don't remember it. It's, you should check it out. It's a great movie, and they Isn't kind it? of they ruck all the time. And Walter Matthau's really crabby, and Jack Lemmon's. Oh, I don't know. It's not so bad. <laughs> Obviously, Jack <laughs> Lemmon. But we did a few. Was who though? Which one was which? <laughs> <laughs> he, he was the crabby one, and I'm the good natured yeah. one sometimes. Um, and we did a few sort of online things on Facebook and stuff, just a pair of us. In fact, we've recorded quite a lot. I've got, I haven't been able to be bothered to go through it all, but we got like four hours of our basement tapes, just me and him shooting the breeze and playing and stuff. It's four just, hours? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. this is legendary stuff, isn't it? I actually had a visa issue, very similarly. You know, you get three year, you know, O one visa. Yeah. yeah. Spend all your life collecting the money and getting all the names and everything. You know what I mean? You need to know your shoe size and everything. Um, and then you know, COVID hits twenty twenty. Next thing you you know, you wonder what you spent and what you, you know, you want to get out there, don't you? It's a nightmare. Isn't it? You want to get your money's worth out of it and then get on with it. Yeah. yeah. That's right. New York's a very nice place to be mincing and uh, hanging out, isn't it? It's a nice... Uh... Well, I've got lots of friends over there, you know. 
and yeah. friends in New York, but friends in LA. And um, yeah, this kind of, I miss them a bit. Whether they miss me is another matter, but I always kind of um, it's like, true, isn't it? down. Well, you, as as an artist, you've definitely you know you're you're a great model of somebody that has like a, a, a musical model of somebody who has um, achieved and hit that zeitgeist at the right time. And you, as long as you cultivate that garden, you really, you'll always have a home to stay in. You'll always have a country that you'll feel like is a part yeah, of you. Well, yeah, maybe. It's just, just, you get on with certain people and they make you welcome and they come over here and I put them up. Mm. It's sort of kind of what goes around comes round kind of thing um, mm. and they just all happen to be you know musicians or fashion designers or record producer types and stuff mm, it's mm, just people mm. you've got on with and accumulated I don't know if it's the right word but mm. you know over the years you know over the many years I've been around yeah yeah for sure for sure no you do accumulate uh, was New York a place that you were going to live or indefinitely just be there I don't know. I've always kind of wanted to spend more time in the States. Although I'm glad I didn't go this year because it's not a great time to be there. Um, but I can never make my mind up between LA and New York. You know, New York, mm. you can walk down the street and bump into people and find out something's going on. LA, you can't do that, but the weather's much better. But there yeah. is stuff going on in LA. But the more you go there, you know, I tend to stay with chums. If you're, if you're staying at the, some rock and roll hotel on Sunset Strip, it's very kind of vacuous. But as soon as you've been there quite a few times and you stay around somebody's house, you know, and you go to the supermarket and you go to the local coffee store and yeah, the, the Wi-Fi kicks in when you walk on and they go, hi, Glenn, you know, you're staying at Clem's again, you know, and you go, yeah, you know. <laughs> and I went out with Clem. Uh, he's a good mate of mine. We do a bit of playing every now and then. Uh-huh. Maybe about a year and a half, two years ago. There's this in Studio City, which is an area in the valley, just yep. over the other side of the Hollywood Hills. There's a cafe called Aroma, where like, all the beautiful people go and they have script meetings there and all that lot. And it's just around the conference. We was in there and this guy came over. Bit, bit slovenly kind of guy with a comic under his arm. And he looked like something out of that movie, High Fidelity. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, started talking to Clem and he introduced me. I think the guy's name was John or something. I can't quite remember. Yeah. And um, I knew him from somewhere. I thought I'd recognise him. Anyway, he had to go and he went. And I said, Clem, who was that guy? And he said, well, it was John. I said, yeah, but I know him from somebody. He said, you don't know who he is? I said, no. He said, you was just talking to Spongebob. I said, what do you mean? He said, he's, he's the guy who invented it and was the voice of Spongebob. That's so amazing. My kids were a little bit younger then, so I just met Spongebob. <laughs> <laughs> Got brownie points. But... Yeah, LA, LA's a funny one. You can really get into the community. Next thing you are doing, everything that a, a Californian does, it's... it's and also, you need a good filter. Your friends have to be good filters in LA. Yeah, yeah. I, I think some of them are. I mean, I've one of the best things I've been, I went, maybe this is about five or six years ago now. I, we went near Burbank, went horse riding. So it's mm-hmm. over the other side of the hill where the Hollywood sign is. Mm-hmm. And there's a ranch there. And it's kind of quite countryfied. And I went with Clem and his missus and a lady friend of mine. And we had that. And they suggest that you go for a drink and a sandwich. Mm. at this place that you drive past on the way in. And we're going, oh, yeah, it's a bit of a tourist trap. And we mm. thought, no, actually, we're going there. Do you know what? We went there, and there's all this music playing. And as we come in, there's a big band on, all these old guys. And it was the original house band who played on the Johnny Carson show. And no they were way. You know, they were like kind of <laughs> Nelson Riddle, Frank Sinatra standard. And then old boys were coming in, and they'd stop. And go back and say, hey, look, Fred's here. Let's do it again. Come on, Fred, you want to hear it again? And then this guy, yeah, and so it was fantastic. Wow. You I know, mean, and all stuff that's not silly rock and roll, but kind of mm-hmm. part of the real LA somehow to me. I don't know. Yeah. I, I like things like that, you know. 
Yeah, me too. Well, it's, the, it's what makes those historical moments in your head, isn't it? You know, when you get those kind of acts that... It's almost like they just come off the street and they've just got a bit of downtime, so they're just going to jump and grab a, an instrument. It's yeah. beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it's but great. then when they do something, they do play really well, you know. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I've I've always I've always had this question I wanted to ask you, um, because obviously, from you know I'm 42. You know what I mean? And I I wasn't there when the punk thing happened. Yeah. Um, do, do you know what? I'd rather be 42. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, listen, right? I often say to myself, I'm like, maybe I was just born in the wrong decade. Do you know what I mean? Like, when I think about your, when I think about the landscape of music, when you were doing music, yeah, you, not only did you set precedence for a lot of events to occur after the fact when you came into the music scene. But um, after that, everything just seemed so much more fun. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, well, yeah, maybe, but I. It all depends what your your starting point is. I was too young mm. for the sixties, but I, all the bands I like were the early Kinks and the Who and the Yardbirds and the Stones and the. Mm. Small faces and stuff like that. That's what, and I was too young for that. And that seems so exciting to me as a young lad growing up, growing up in Kensal Green. Mm. Um, and all the pirate radio stations and mm. and Mary Quant and, and the, the King's Road and that. So I think wherever you are, there's always a bit beforehand. Mm. And um, but I think when you learn to play a guitar or an instrument or something, you tend to go back to that a little bit. Yeah, and I, I, you know, you think think of all the stuff that came after the Pistols, and then it's getting new wave, and then all those two time yeah. bands come out. But they were like yeah. playing Bluebeat and Scar that they must have heard first time around when they were a bit too young to do anything about it. But then when they form a band, they kind of go back. Yeah, you know, when Green Day came for it, it was about ten years after the, the original punk thing had happened. So, you know, a good example of that, um, we'll definitely stay on this track because I'm extremely keen to get your perspective in a, in a, from a historical reference point of genres at the time. But um, a great example of somebody that had did, did do that was uh, Lemmy when he did the head cap thing. It's right. almost like he went back to where his favourite moments in music were, right? Yeah. That's just that, that I think there are, there are things that people... You know, you're you're born into music, and you'll, it'll never lose you. And although the influences of what you think are obvious to you as an artist, they don't always translate, but they're still there in your music, aren't they? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I actually quite like doing that. You play a record, I can normally I like picking where they nicked it from, not not the actual copy of the tune or something, but that is that kind of thing where it comes from. You know, and mm. it makes sense with Lemmy as a certain age. The, the head cat. I mean, I'm equally mate. So I was talking about Clem Burke, but with, with Slim Jim Phantom, and he plays yeah. on my last album. He's so, great, and as as a beatboxer, he him as a you know he's he embodies the, the kind of rock drummer. Like yeah, but, know, yeah, but he's, he's not. I don't say he's a rock drummer. He's he's different. He's he kind of swings. You know, he's he swing. Rock, yeah, he swings. Most rock drummers are quite straight, but he swings. Yeah, yeah. Do, okay. Do you get into that kind of rockabilly stuff? Are you into that? You know, because punk morphed into all different sorts of things. Like you say, it went into all, it kind of filtered into all different new it, genres. It was a very broad church, you know. Yeah. There's a big difference between X-ray specs and wire. Mm. There's a big difference between the Clash and the Buzzcocks. Mm. There's a big difference between the Raincoats and the Ramones, but they're all punk. Is there any that you, at the time, where you were like, you actually, I, them, they're, they're, they're really doing something, you know? Was there any that really stuck out to you at the time? Oh, a few, yeah. yeah. I was a big Buzzcocks fan, I liked. Yeah. I think the band that cut it for me the most was the, the Heartbreakers, you know, Johnny Thunder's mm. band. Mm-hmm. Oh, mate. I yes. saw them, the first time I saw them, they 
before the Anarchy Tour, which we only did a tiny little bit of it, we had some stage rehearsals and they arrived from New York. I think they came straight from the airport and got up and did their set. And mm. they, they can half play, you know. Yeah, but they've been gigging a lot, you know. They'd all been in bands before. They, they'd been gigging around as well. Right? They had it, you know. That yeah. was part of an eye opener. Johnny Thunder was crazy. They was nearly as good as us. <laughs> <laughs> What about when it went into the kind of new romantics era and things like that? And did it, did it, I mean, I guess it was the order of the day, right? That there was, there's certain music that really define an era. But did you, did you mess with that? Did you like that kind of thing? No, no and that's kind of, I, the band I had after the Sex Pistols was the Rich Kids. And I think we were a bridge between right. that and the new romantic thing. But two of the guys, in the band, I mentioned Rusty Egan earlier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was the drummer, and Mid Year, who was a singer of Rich Kids, they did a side project with this guy, and it took off. And the guy was Steve Strange, and the project was Visage. Wow. It took, and it kind of broke my band up, really. You know. Shit. Yeah. So it would, it would do, wouldn't it? You know, they was in a way they were right. They did the right thing at the right time. If that's mm. what you want to do, but. Mm. When that happened, I actually got a phone call from a bloke called Riggy Pop and went off and played with him. And the first time I ever went to New York. Crazy. I was actually playing with Iggy Pop and we did a show at, where was it? What's the place called on Canal Street? I forget the name of the place. Big place. It was Halloween. The whole yeah. audience was dressed in Halloween gear. Oh, my God. <laughs> The Cramps supported us. Oh, my God. Okay. And, back, and backstage was Debbie Ari dressed as a witch, and she gave me a kiss on the cheek. <laughs> this is too yeah. much it intel. It was the first time I went to New York. You know. <laughs> and you never looked back. <laughs> yeah. I would have played him. That's the name of the place. It's not, not there anymore, but it was great. Who do you think first came up? Because, you know, look, there's conflicting conversations. You know, you're like, you know, Ramones say one thing, Iggy Pop was another, and then they're... Do you know New York Dolls? Well, they're all wrong. You're going to say what come first is for yeah. punk. Yeah. The Kingsman. Okay. Who did? The Kingsman. The Kingsman. Did Louie Louie. Yeah. Which right. was then covered yeah, by... Back to Lemmy. I was at Rack yeah. Studios in London once. And I, it was kind of quite funny, actually, because Motorhead had been in, and they weren't in there that day, but yeah. the studio hadn't been stripped down properly, and they had a music stand-up. With Louis Louis on it, you know, with the words, and it's like if you have to read the music to play Louis Louis, it's a bit <laughs> kind of weird. You know? It depends what they were doing in the studio, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, I'm a massive Motorhead fan. Anybody on the podcast will tell you that one. It's, uh, I, I, you know, people with um, uh, depth and integrity to anything they do has got to be, you know, worth it worth their salt hasn't it you know? yeah I think some of the people you mentioned I think what's made them good is they actually lived it somehow mm. you know it wasn't a pose it was so real yeah it is and everything is kind of a pose now without getting into some kind of you know old head hater kind of conversation it is, it is it's a very funny time where you, if you think something enough and you embody it enough you become it but it doesn't necessarily well, mean like you represent it, it. <laughs> Say that again? Like a Brexiteer, you mean? <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing, yeah. Um, yeah, so... Are so on camera or is this just audio? Because that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we got the camera on, baby. Yeah, oh, we, got no, I, we got you. <laughs> I'll stand by that. <laughs> um, and the landscape is way different, is way different. What defines somebody that's with, with that level of integrity? I mean, you come from an era that embodies, you know... You, you walk out how you talk it, don't you? You know, hmm. what defines that now? What What is the real message? I, in I, I don't know. I mean, it's gone of the days when I slavishly went to Tottenham Court Road on a Thursday morning to get the brand new edition of the NME or the Melody Maker mm. or Sounds are all free. I, I don't know anymore. It's, it's a, yeah, I just do what I do. And yeah. If people dig it, great. If they don't. I saw you at a um, hundred club. I think it was a charity based thing. I actually took a photo with you. Um, uh, my fanboy was on thirteen plus. You know, oh, right. on that on money. <laughs> it, it was Back a wicked day. show. It was a wicked show. I can't remember who it was with. They were a, they were a band from West London. Um, one of them was a rapper guy, and you were playing guitar. 
charity oh. gig, maybe 2012, no, 2015 or something. I can't remember what it was. I can't remember what it was. No, I probably just got up with them or something. I yeah, I think it was something like that. And, you know, of, of course, that was mind-blowing and awesome. Uh, but it also, it, it's, it said so much. You, you've gone on and, you you know, from Camden Crawl every year, you know, and, and just always being present in the rock and roll scene. Um, do like how far do you go like you've seen it all like is does anything surprise you do, when you see stuff does it ever surprise you like oh i didn't see that you know what i mean sometimes but sort of i don't know it's so sort of, yeah. i don't know the, the older you get the more you, you've seen it before a little bit but yeah how does that how does that feel? But, you know, it's, some, it's kind of weird, though. I mean, the, the records that really made an impression upon me, and they're not even that current so much now, but it really give, give them a side swerve. And you might think this is weird for an ex-punk, but, you know, when Hey Ya come out, yeah. Outcast, I thought, I had to go and buy it. I, yeah. I bought that. And Happy by Farrell Williams. It's like... Everything. Yeah. They, they, they were so good and so different for the Which time. It's a great cover, by the way. You guys do a killer cover of that. Thank you. And that's, yeah. Well, that's for Slim Jim and Manel, actually, yeah. yeah, yeah. But that, yes. that was me going back to the... Not going back to the 60s deliberately, but when I heard Happy for the first time, it's got all those jazzy piano chords in it, and mm. they don't kind of resolve, and it annoyed me. And I tried to work it out, but not being the best guitarist in the world, I always simplify things, and I think I ended up with a riff that sounded a bit more like the pretty things doing it. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. That. and in fact, I was in the pretty things for one night once. I was mates with Phil May, and they were, um, they, they, their bass player couldn't make a gig. So. What? what? All right, look, we have to get into this. Okay, so let's go back to because now I'm just completely like overindulged with so much information right let's go back okay so Iggy Pop how did you get how did you get the call from him how many shows did you do what went down he um well it was when the I sort of split the rich kids up basically and I was sitting at home and I thought I don't really know what I'm going to do now wouldn't it be great if the phone rang and really two minutes later the phone rang no way and it was Iggy Pop's manager and they were in town they were looking for a bass player the guy who played bass, this is going back to the New Values album they've made. Right. Um, he was going to play second guitar on the tour, and they were short somebody. And I think my agent at the time knew that the rich kids had broken up, mm -hmm. and um, he was also Iggy's agent, so he suggested me. But that was John Giddens, who puts on the, the Isle of Wight Festival every year. Right. So I met him, the next thing I'm on tour, and it we did a tour of Europe and a tour of America and made made another album in the middle of that called Soldier. Wow. It was originally going to be called Onward Christian Soldiers. I'll say that again. It was originally going to be called Onward Christian Soldiers. Uh -huh. Even Iggy thought that was possibly a bit of too much. So <laughs> <laughs> we just called it Soldier. Yeah. So, and um, that was interesting because everything I'd done up to that stage They'd been with mates as roadies and we had leaves that didn't work properly and he didn't really know how to get there. And Iggy had been touring, you know, he'd been touring a lot and I had a proper yeah. crew and a, a proper tour manager and decent hotels and you're flying places. And yeah, not that that's impressive in itself, but it was just organized. It was proper, you know, it was yeah. the first real proper thing that I did. How infectious is Iggy? Like, does he, before stage, does he? Does he just switch on into that this this character and how how infectious is that for you as a perform performer performing alongside him? That must have been crazy. Was he kind of like a on and off, on and off stage? Well, no, you would see him becoming, you know, during the day he's James Osterberg, and yeah. then he sort of slowly turns into, or he used to turn into Iggy as it was getting up to showtime kind of thing. Love it, um, love it, hmm. demonic. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. It makes kind of logical sense that you that you would be fitted for his band, you know, be fitted to go on tour, tour with him. Well, I was quite proud when, when I did play with him, and he hadn't been doing that well at the time. Yeah. And I, when 
I played with him. I think I opt up the ante a little bit somehow. And I remember we did the Emerson Vodium, the Lyceum Ly- 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 and the Music Machine. Mm. Sold them all out in one week. Love that. So that was kind of... Yeah, yeah, and that's got a lot to do with you being involved. You know who did that as well? Johnny Marr did that with the band of Cribs. He came in for us for an album. And I, was just, I, I always love it when artists, individual like instrumentalists it's, it's do like, that. It, it, it's... I think a lot of some musicians are like that, and I was like that. You know, there was never a big sea change. It was, it was it's an Isaac Newton quote that you know he, he didn't think he was that clever. He was just standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, he was building upon what came before. You know, when I did my band of rich kids, which we had our moment in the sun, but mm. it's quite fortunate we ended up getting Mick Ronson mm. producing us. Yeah, mm. and then we needed some piano on a track, and Ronson's a pretty good piano player. Yeah. But it wasn't right what he was doing. And he's, he said, because he's more of a classical kind of type pianist, uh-huh. grade eight piano, very talented, clever bloke. And I mm. said, it's not quite right, mate. And he said, well, what should it be like, Jerry Lee Lewis? And I said, no, like Ian McGlagan. And the mm. studio he was in, which was Johnny Congo. Do you know Johnny Congo's? Mm, no. He, he did that song, Tokoloshi Man, that, that um, Happy Mondays did as Step on oh. You again. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, Johnny Congress had a studio, and he was using the studio, and the engineer overheard us talking, and he said, well, Ian McGlagan was down here last week, I got his phone number. So we called him up, and he came down, and I got on like a house on fire. Wow. And, he was, and he'd been in the small faces, and I, to me, he was like the best. Yeah keyboard player and Hammond organ player and it is like the white version of Booker T. I was playing with him. Yeah, and you were inspired it, a lot it, by them, weren't you? You were inspired by a lot. Yeah, I mean, it was a good starting point. Yeah. You know, but then because I sowed the seeds many years ago with that, I kept in touch with Matt and sadly he's no longer with us. Mm. But because of that, I mean, it's 10 years ago now, but I think the mm. biggest thing I've ever done for me personally with my all-time favourite band was The Faces. Mm-hmm. They didn't have a bass player, so Mac asked me. That's crazy. So you know, we did wow. do that many shows, but the the last show that we, I did do with them, wow, we had Line the Fuji Festival in Japan in front of fifty thousand people, and that was the band. Yeah, wow. So I used to stand in front of the, the mirror with my guitar that I hadn't learned to play properly yet. You know, when I was fourteen. So that was cool. This is so you know we're all kind of fans, but we're yeah. not silly fanboys. I, I thought as a bass player, I brought something to the equation because I realised you have to play one of your lane's bass parts to make it make it sound like faces. And you just have to be good. You've got to be good at your craft. There's some serendipity. Yeah, but you've, yeah. got, you've got to be simpatico as well. You know, you've got. To, there's, there's no point doing the faces and then playing bass like Jaco Pistorius. It's yeah, that's fun. true. Yeah, no, no, you're right, you're right. And some, um, yeah, some uh, instrumentalists, some people that come into bands, it, it just doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, you've just got to accept defeat in a way, haven't you? That's, that's yeah. still... Yeah, man, look at your career, man. You've just, you've literally just been at the right place. Yeah, but it's, right... it's been very up and down, you know, so... It's, it's up and down part of the... It's that, is that part of the... Uh, um, is that part of the mission brief? Is it like... Because the you know speaking personally on my career, you know the lows have hit hit the floor, but then sometimes you just get a bit of good luck, and it's it's I don't know it's it's synergy. And next thing you're shooting back up, it's, that, it, it's ups and downs all the time, isn't it? Yeah, but well, I think that's I think you just got to, I don't know you just got to be open to it and not get so uptight about things. Like, really hard, isn't it? Sometimes it's just the way it is. You know, what's been the hardest time for you? I think at the moment is it's it's beginning to wear a bit thin at the moment now. Yeah, hurting. <clears throat> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but but you know, it's good to talk. <laughs> it's good to talk, mate, isn't it? It yeah. is. Um, wow. What's the highest of the high? I mean, obviously, face the faces. That's pretty big, right? <laughs> that's like up top. Yeah, that that was pretty cool. Yeah, pistol stuff, but. In the last couple of years, I've been quite fortunate to do a couple of odd things. I've met, I've met some people who do like these alternative festivals around the world. Mm. I actually went and played with a 
Korean band on the um, north south border of North and South Korea. Oh, that's mad. Wow. We to the Peace Train Festival. That was interesting. And then we could, when I got involved with those people, I actually went and was like the kind of guest of honor somehow mm. to Ramallah in Palestine and played with some, there was like <laughs> a, a showcase of Palestinian acts. And I got up and did a few numbers with them. And we had to rehearse. And they took me to my their rehearsal place, yeah. which was in the middle of Ramallah, which was upstairs in a like a, a kids' music school, which was above the Western Bridal Wear shop. <laughs> we went up <laughs> there, and there was these kids having cello lessons and learning recorders, and we had to had to get the drum kit from another room. And I said, "Oh, I go, no, 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 you're on it." And I said, "No, I like that. It. it was fantastic. You know, yeah, I'm in the middle of Palestine doing that." That's yeah, a, I love like, it. You know, the real life experience brings and lovely, lovely people, and it, it was a real eye opener to what goes on politically as well. I came back thinking, mm, yeah, you know, if you, if you, yeah, you put people in cages, you shouldn't be surprised if they want to rattle it every now and then. You know? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Oh well, you know, it's like, is... you know, and I think that things in life, if the chance presents itself say yes go and find out things for yourself mm. you know otherwise you're just you're just beholden to what the lion right wing press want to tell you mm. you know do you have any uh, do you have any regrets in uh that's a really big question actually to be fair but do you have any regrets in the sense that because you you talk about just learning to say yes, I guess. Just just be present and just opportunities knock. Is there any regrets you've had where you're just like, oh man, I should have I should have done that though. That would have been good. Um thus far, by the way. Yeah. I'm not naming any names or anything, but I do think looking back that maybe a quick write up might have come in and in. <laughs> <laughs> Such a time saves nine kind of thing. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, so you, I, I never got the opportunity to. I mean, I think my uh, my crew at the time was a scratch perverts. They were a hip hop based DJ uh, for, fortet, um, and I think they supported you guys the, uh, at the Sex Pistols Brixton Academy show. Oh, what with Goldie? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. What a lineup that was! That's insane. Yeah, I, don't, I, I think Goldie was actually was um, sort of thought, "What on earth is he doing?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think the Scratch Perverts were all also thinking, "What we did," but I kind of got it. It was like generational uh, um, uh, renegade music, yeah, flame holders. I guess that was that was my way of thinking about it. Anyway. How did they go down? I wish I'd gone. How, how did they go down for you on stage? And being... um, how did they go down? Well, I, I must admit, I didn't watch them all the way through. Goldie did say to me one night that he was quite, although he was struggling a bit, he was quite pleased because they threw so much, so many coins at him, and he actually made quite a few bucks. <laughs> <laughs> out of those shows... Yeah. One night, we did five nights there, and one night we was waiting to go on. And these sort of, sort of heavy sort of bounces appeared in the doorway, looking out into the corridor mm -hmm. about half hour before we went on. Mm -hmm. This bloke with grey hair, a bit like me now, I could, he caught my eye, you know, like through their arms, filling up the doorway. Yeah, yeah. Come on in. And it was, um, I forget his name now. Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. Stop it. He came down to check us out and I made him a cup of Nescaf. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. So that was fun. How was it getting back together with the guys? For those shows? Yeah, yeah it was all right. We did it. Yeah. A bit more grown up than we were back then. Yeah. No, I watched it. It was good. I mean, playing... Especially playing with Steve and Paul. Well, the good thing about it is we actually learned to play together. Mm. So we walked mm. into a room and plug in our instruments and we got something in common that nobody else in the rest of the world has, is that we're the Sex Pistols. We don't even have to try that hard, you know. And all, all still alive. 
Original members still alive. That that blows my mind. I also think that with the Rolling Stones as well. I, I still f- find that unfathomable that that a band of such. I, I got for a few lead guitarists along the way. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> That's true. But but and, and another thing, yeah, you know, I told you I did the thing with the the pretty yeah. things. Yeah. And he used to live near me. He used to drink in the local. I saw kind of new Phil. And Dick Taylor, who was the original bass player in the Rolling Stones, and I said, but "What happened with the Stones with you?" And he said, "Well, to, to be honest, Glenn, I, I didn't really see any future in it." <laughs> well, <laughs> but again, it's each to their own, isn't it? I mean, you go there and you show up and you do something; it doesn't always click, does it? Well, so perhaps it just we weren't the right thing at the right time. Yeah, yeah. You were contributive to uh, writing a lot of the, well, no instrumentally writing a lot of the Sex Pistols stuff, correct? Yeah, and, and I wrote some lyrics as well, not a lot, but Pretty Bacon's my song. I wrote the lyrics on it. Oh my God, that's one of my favourite, favourite tunes, without question, without question. The, 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 yeah, it, it says so much. And I like that, I like the in-play, the play on Pretty, you know? Yeah. Uh, I like that. It's good. It's good. Um, yeah, it's it's a funny one because that time there, again, just going back to your the inception of Glenn Matlock, you was again right place, right time, cemented, and you, you pretty much were able to that synergy of punk and what it represented and how new it was and fresh it was. Well, I mean, back then it wasn't even called punk when we started out. Mm. And it became called that afterwards. We didn't really know what we were doing. We knew, we didn't know what we wanted to sound like. We just knew what we didn't want to sound like, but we was going to do it anyway. Mm. <laughs> and it kind of came out. But I think lots of people are like that. And then, you know, and then you're, the music you make, you're the sum of the parts and all oh, those different influences that they've kind of, um, what's the word um, I was mosified you know by capillary action they sucked up all these things that they like and then you get in a room and you play a bit and then people don't like what you're doing and you argue about it and it's like oh but your way and then you sneak a little bit in and the other looks doing the same thing and that's how it comes out yeah 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 <laughs> it's, it is, it's, it, it's it's cherry picking bits elements of things isn't it yeah but not like not copying, because I think when it's good, is you do it, but you yeah. don't realise you're doing it. It's only no, when no. you look back that that's what you've done. Negotiating skills in a in a band as well, isn't there? Yeah, you like, get to be a bit of a politician there. You know. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you, you have to you have to pick your fights, isn't that the the, the, the term? You know, you, you know when to. You know, there's bigger fights to have. So you have that one. Okay, I'm just going to leave that there. I'm not going to argue about that. You just don't. Uh, <laughs> there must be a lot of that as well, eh? There's a bit of that. But that's when that goes back to the right, the right hook at the right time. Right time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel that. I do feel that. Were you in Denmark Street when people, because you guys, you had a stint where you were living in one of the back rooms there, right? That, that, yeah. Were you, yeah, you were around at that time. Was it really oh, like... I found the place. It was an advert in Melody Maker. You found the place? Yeah, it was an advert in Melody Maker, and I yeah. saw it and showed it to Malcolm. And it turns out the place we had that belonged to a band called Badfinger. Right. And because two of them had topped themselves, sadly, um, oh, shit. they didn't need it anymore. And the guy was getting rid of the lease. And the and funny thing was, the guy who was their manager who was getting rid of the lease mm-hmm. was this guy called Bill Collins. And he likes us, and he sort of took us under his wing a little bit and helped yeah. out. I don't think he ever got the money for the lease. And we went round to visit him up in Endon by Golders Green. Yeah. And his son, outside, but there was a um, an old ice cream van or an ambulance that had been sort of turned into a, you know, like a, a sleeper van. Mm-hmm. And as we was getting there, his son was leaving, who must have been about in his early 20s, possibly, and he he was going off to do repertory theatre for the first time, and he was going to sleep in this van, <laughs> and his son was Lewis Collins, who ended up in The Professionals. Wow. 
Dude. And it's quite funny that Stephen Paul, after the Sex Pistols, they called their band the Professionals. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it all goes round. Yeah, yeah. Do you speak to those guys still, do you, Steve, uh, uh, Cookie? Do you speak to any oh, of those yeah, guys? Yeah, once in a blue moon. Not a blue moon. Deal, but, yeah. you know, we can all pick up the phone and speak to each other if we wanted to. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I, um, yeah, so Denmark Street back then, was it as bustling musically as as the, the legend has it? Soho? Yeah, I mean, that, that was the great thing, was living in something on the edge of Soho. I don't, I don't know if that bit's really... Soho there, is it? It's just on the edge of it. And being yeah, at Art College, there was at St. Martin's, you know, when I was yeah. 17 and a half, 18. That was kind of cool. Mm. Yeah, but the Denmark Street was far more buzzing than it is now. I had a, a did, did you, and I'm not sure if this is true, but I, I heard the story of why the old grey whistle test, the programme is called the old grey whistle test. Do you know this story? Yeah, I do. Yeah. What's your version of it? Well, my version of it was, the, they called the old greys ex-army servicemen that came from the war and they had no jobs, so they'd be pol- uh, post office workers. And they'd walk down the road and the studios would open the windows and play the music loud. And when, if you hear the postie, the old grey, whistling the tune that he's just heard by you turning it up in the studio, that's yeah. the old grey whistle test. Is that right? Oh, you know, you get something catchy. Yeah, kind of similar thing. I didn't know what to do with the war. I just thought it was some old bloke and like possibly a grey cardigan. If he if he whistled the latest tune, it means yeah. he got a hit. So something did that affect. Was it noisy there? I can see this is when I think of that, I'm like, yeah, like this must have been like um, just a mesh of just no, like there's just... all kind of those places you bump into people and it was because it was beginning to punk and then there was some other things going around. There was like some old, old, older school people mm. that went out there a bit. Yeah, like, I, I remember in the music it? shop, there was a guy called John Miles who was always in there. You know, he did music. He was my first love. He was always mm. hanging out. So I, I think maybe he wasn't as busy as he wanted to be. Yeah, yeah. He should be hanging there, yeah, you know. Even you back yeah. then, you were going to... And there would be somebody playing Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> and they still do it. Yeah. On the guitar. And like if I if somebody's doing that in a a guitar store, I normally turn around and walk out, apart from once. The the one right at the end, you know, not the train cross road and the mm. other one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. I went in there and what's it? Hank. Is that Hank's right there? And upstairs. And I thought, what on earth's that thing? And I got out of the top and there's a bloke playing Stairway to Heaven, but it was great because he was playing it on a banjo through a fuzz box. Nice. <laughs> nice. So I'll let him off for that one. <laughs> yeah. I bet New York was like that too back then as well, you know, carrying on this like romantic idea I have in my head of music being so much better than I was born in the wrong generation. Um, I think guess, everyone says that really. You know? I think everyone says that, right? Yeah. It's just the way it is in... in because nostalgia is nice and cosy, isn't it? And it's like, you, even when you weren't even there, you think you were. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But even if you go back to the people who were there for the, par- for the period that you possibly think you was at, they probably wish they were somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Did you ever go CBGBs? I, I got a guided tour. I never saw a band there, but I got a guided tour one afternoon by Steve Bates. You know, he was in the Dead Boys. Mm, Steve. Steve Bates. And then he ended up in Lord okay. of the New Church. So he was sort of a mate, and we went out for a walk, and he took me in there. And do you know what? It was the biggest dump I've ever been to in my life. It was, filled, it was all dog shit on the floor. It really? Was yeah. Come out of the place, you had to wipe the shit off of your shoes. No way. But, was it all just like graffitied up and just yeah. bombed? Yeah, it was filthy. I mean, really, really filthy. I think I went home and had a shower, actually. <laughs> just the clam, get the clam off. Yeah. Well, you know, it was part of the thing. And now it's a John Varvata store. That's right, yes. But all the original wall designs and stuff, I think they've kept that in there, haven't they? They've kept the same... Aesthetic. I don't know. So perhaps there's a room out the back, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That was very similar to, to your guys' place in Denmark Street. It, it, and it was in the back, wasn't it? 
but it was it was like an agency office or something, wasn't it? But they still there, kept there, there used to be an old Greek Greek bookshop there, and mm. there was a room out the back, a little courtyard, and it was like an old sweatshop. It was very Victorian or Georgian, mm. and it was a, a room that was about ten foot square, and then another room above it, and the ten foot square room was was um, where we rehearsed, and then. Mm. Initially, me and Steve lived there. Mm, mm, mm. Steve went on to, I mean, obviously he does the, the radio show as well, but he went through that kind of, he went through that uh, Rainbow Bar and Grill glam rock phase, didn't he? He, he kind of, what yeah, did you think of that era? What did you think of that? Not a lot. Yeah, it wasn't really your thing? No, but if he was living in LA, it's going it to make a lot of difference. I mean, if you go there and you, which I do, I haven't been for a while now, but, if you do and you get a hire car and you drive uh, um, on Ventura Freeway mm. and Ventura Freeway by uh, the Doobie Brothers, whoever did it, comes on. Mm-hmm. It makes a lot more sense than if you're driving or you're sitting on the bus in accent, you know. It's true. It's true. It's so very it's true. Courses, you know? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, And punk, or at least... Our version of rock over here, it it relates so madly well to the climate, doesn't it? Mm. You know, that's mm. part of the export, isn't it? That's part of the export of British so. music. Yeah. yeah. What's your take on that? Because obviously, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, protests going on about live music not being funded, uh, and you know, the likes of yourself. You know I mean, hanging about, waiting for something to change. And yeah, like you say, it's got you down. It's What's my take on it? My take on it is that they have started to help people out a bit now. I'm friends with Jeff Horton from The 100 Club. and oh. uh, been ch- he's, he's actually won some funding to keep the, the place open. As That's a, brilliant. But it's great, yeah. And it's, it's a reasonable amount of money. Um, and other kind of prestigious clubs around the country have done it. But there's been no help from musicians. Yeah. I'm, I'm really annoyed that. Yeah, I'm with you. You know, I have to pay my tax. They, I've got tax bill. They want their money from. Me. Yeah. No help whatsoever. So, yeah. you know, luckily I'm not skimped, but I'm also thinking the other people who are in the same boat mm. as me aren't quite so fortunate. So, no, no, uh, that's right. But I think the problem we got is that the Tories know full well that musicians tend not to um, vote for them. Mm. Yeah. You know? But yeah. on the other hand, as Jeff pointed out, that UK, the UK music industry is a big net, net. I think it's like the fifth, the fifth biggest contributor yeah. to the revenue. Yeah, 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 to the economy. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that's so right. So you've got an urgency, so. Yeah. I, and Jeff said he had a meeting with. Um, I'm sure he won't mind saying this, mm. but he had some kind of meeting with some people in government before they won their award. Right. You know, like you kind of, all you guys just know about Glastonbury and all that. He said, but I would look back over the last 10 years Mm. of people who'd headlined Glastonbury and like 75% of them have played at the Andrew Club. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know. Cut the chops. I know that, but, you know, Lord Ponsonby Smythe doesn't necessarily know that until it's put in front of them, which they did do and they kind of realised. So whether something else would come out of it, don't know. It's having these spokespeople that are really like yourself that are like are so um they you've adapted and climatized to so many different situations in in years of of operating in music. This really has been a you know a, a you know your backs against the wall now, and it's and it needs people like you guys who have had the experience to to be up front with these people, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, it's like what can you do? You can keep going on at them. Yeah, perhaps it sort of sinks in a little bit, a little bit. But we'll all adapt as we always do do. But you know, why does it have to be so hard all the time? And I just don't think it's it's fair. You know, I'm not saying oh no no no, it's not fair. But you know, why should one lot of people get furloughed mm. who do one particular thing that might actually not be as important? Yeah, that's right. Oh, well, it goes with everything. And, I mean, and another another slice of the people just don't. So it's, yeah. It's wrong. And it's industry as well. How come McDonald's is open when a fitness training centre isn't? You know. Well, 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, it's quite a good excuse not to have to work out. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Right. <laughs> I'll give you that. Like, I'm, I'm, there's, a bit, there's a big difference between people huffing and puffing and sweating and sneezing and flying everywhere. Yeah, then some junk food. Somebody nipping in and out and getting a... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I feel that. Big mat. I, I don't know. Um, but the music, the music thing, though, by the, I mean, I've used this analogy before, and it and it still holds weight. I, you know, they're quick to celebrate the, the achievements of the likes of yourself and David Bowie, and and you know, and and all these amazing artists that have come through generation Queen. They play them on the Olympic 2012 as if like this is a stamp of our culture and how amazing are we? And then they and then once that's once that's done, they put you back in a box and you know and it's just that's just it's insulting isn't it mm. bastards bastards i tell you bastards. bastards um but like you're saying uh, the show must go on and you're uh, you're doing a lot of work at the moment you've got four hours worth of content somewhere locked up but somewhere. Saying, i've made what i'm more interested in and yeah it's a bit slow at the moment but a brand new album of stuff that's really good can't wait. Actually, um, Can't wait. But hopefully it'll be up yeah. next year now. But it's, it's good. It's like a studio album. There's the stuff that we did for a laugh I was talking to him about. But, mm. um, and I, stuff. I was quite chuffed. I actually got, I bumped into Norman Watroy at the Clash opening and their thing. And I said, what are you doing tomorrow? And he said, nothing. Why? I said, do you want to come and play some bass with me? I love that. And he came down and played bass on it. So well, that's kind of cool. How much of it is confidence in that? I mean, putting yourself in that position. I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of other people over the years and years and years of you working where you're just like, have I got the balls to actually ask that question? I don't know. Oh, yeah, fucking really. Well, do. do you know what I found over the years of asking people stuff? Go on. It's what's the worst thing can happen? Yeah. You know, yeah. And what is the worst thing can happen? Mm. You end up making a cunt of yourself. And how many times have we all done that? So <laughs> they have to say yes or no. And most people are pleased to be asked. You know, yeah. I thought what Roy would be really, really sort of, oh, no, my diary is full of sessions. And he said, I'm not doing nothing. You know? well, well, I have to admit, Glenn. Like, so that was right at the beginning of all this happening, you know. So, yeah, and you had it all kind of, yeah, and I guess it was but, almost you know, too there, but there was an of it, you know. Yeah. Um, I, well, I'll tell you what, it, you know, uh, I asked you. Yeah, and look what I got. I got you on the show. So yeah. I'm, uh, I'm stoked to bits, man. I'm stoked to bits. You don't get what you don't ask for. That's right. That's right. Man, I he got. That's what I'm saying. Um, so what happened to your bike then? So I hear you've been, you got your bike nicked or something. I had a bike and I, it, getting on a bit, I did have a nice um, bike that's electrically assisted and I had it chained to the fence outside and it's a bit <laughs> curvy for me because I live down in the basement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> somebody, somebody came round in the middle of the night with an angle grinder. And whacking great big. Hang on. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> I can hear him. I think he's bringing the chain. He must be bringing the chain. That's for insurance purposes. Jeez. I want to wait for like a real sort of like carbon kryptonite thing. Look. Jesus, I mean, you've got to hand it to them for the brazen fucking, what a cheek. What a cheek. So, so that put a stop, that put a stop to your... Uh, well, I've got the insurance paid out and I've got another one, but actually what I did do, I've got um, I got a fold-up one that I can put in the back of the car every night now. So. Well, electric? Yeah. Who but steals a who steals a punk icon's fucking bike? Tell me that. That's that's me- that, That's the world we're living in. Well, keeps you fit a little bit, but you still got to pedal a bit. So, yeah, you got to push it along in it. This is the new thing, isn't it? I mean, you know, you see everyone riding these things now, especially in West London. Eh? I, I better than getting on the tube and all that. Yeah, yeah. The, the days, you, days, days. You're going to go out for a walk. You know where you can get to in half an hour is the same old places. Yeah. But in half an hour from me, I can get down to London Bridge or somewhere like that. So it's kind of yeah. it's mad, isn't it? These new yeah, yeah it's, it's, like, it's getting a bit nippy now. So we'll see. Yeah, it's getting that way, isn't it? It's recording, it's, it's, it's music writing weather now, isn't it? Yeah, it would be. It's just my head's still full of this album I haven't kind of got out yet. So. Yeah, because until you get it out... You've, it's you're... like you just, it sort of clogs up your, your head space. Perhaps yeah. that's an excuse, I don't know. 
Is it like a tap for you? Is you it, know, it, what are you going to write about? There's so much to write about, but basically, at the moment, it's probably about how sort of fed up and pissed off we, we are. And I don't really want to write about that. I'd rather write something a bit more up somehow. Well, you got you got to think yourself kind of lucky that you made the album before the downer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. At least, at least the music's going to feel a, a plenty and vibrant and not like you've been stuck in a house on and off for a year. Yeah, oh no, it's certainly an up experience. Yeah. Mm. Well, we'll look forward to it, Glenn. Yeah, so now you've done that, I might actually go and and fire up my computer. And... Yes, and yes. I've, I've got a new guitar as well, look, I'm just going to... Yeah, go on. Don't, don't expect too much, because I'm not much of a guitarist, but it's a beauty, look, this is... <laughs> And it's a, an old Hofner, and it's exactly the same. Oh, that is lush. Tommy Still, who was England's first rock and roller. Oh, my God. Did, so. oh. Anyway, I'm not going to fight. Love it. Hey, Glenn, you know you're getting yourself in trouble when you're talking to me about this now. I'm going to have to throw it out there. If you don't ask, you don't get. I'd love to come and do a beatbox uh, something with you. I'll be your drums. I'll be oh, your drums. Okay. All right. I might well take you out on that. There you go. There you go. If you don't ask, you don't get 2020. There you go. Yeah. Glenn, it's been a real pleasure, my brother. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good. Hope it was good for you too. Yeah, it was fun. Cup of tea and then fire up the computer. That's the one. See, inspiration reigns supreme. Killer Killer Podcast. Glenn Matlock's getting in the studio. Yes. <laughs> All right, fella. Thank you very much for my Killer Killer Podcast. We are like it was out of fashion. Thank you so much for joining us. You stay oh. lucky, people. Don't forget to share. Peace. Peace on you. Bye. Yeah.